Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, welcome to uh, a very important show on evolution. I'm here with Sabur Ahmed. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. You're right. Good. You're good. One of the researchers at AIRA. And we're going to be discussing um, Darwinian evolution. How certain, let's get started straight away, Sabur. How certain are we of Darwinian evolution? And more specifically, I want to ask you, how certain are we that we have the same ancestors as present day, let's say, chimps? Okay. Brilliant question. All I'm going to do in this show, inshallah, yeah. God willing, is show the popular narrative, which is it is as certain as planetary motion, as certain as the planets going around the, uh, around the sun, that we are certain this has happened, because this is the sort of uh, certainty that Darwin is speak with. Okay. And I'm going to show in the... Are you challenging that certainty? I'm not. Okay. I'm going to show the academics, not me, right. say it is based on a probabilistic framework which has multiple assumptions which are being challenged and its core concepts are disputable. So are you saying that what's happening on a popular level is completely different from what's going on in the academic world? Absolutely. And this is not just something which I'm pointing out. This is something that even the British government understands that the academia is... Uh, the, what's known in academia hasn't filtered down to the uh, general masses, which is why they run projects to uh, narrow the gap. Right. But what I would say when it comes to Darwin's particular theory... Yeah. Uh, Richard Dawkins in The Blind Watchmaker says Darwin allowed us to be intellectually satisfied atheists. Before right. Darwin, it could have been tenable to be an atheist, right. but he allowed us to be intellectually satisfied atheists. So because of that, we've got a deliberate campaign by humanists, by atheists, by Darwinists to miseducate the public on this particular issue. Sounds quite conspiratorial, Sabor. I mean, it does. <laughs> I mean, is it just what you're saying, or is there some people from like an academic perspective that have also made the same kind of claim? Well, what you'll find, and this is very, very interesting, yeah. is that mainstream secular academics who are themselves like who like, atheists, yeah. for example, yeah. James Shapiro, he okay. is a um, Cambridge educated evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago, right. and he basically um, says that it's a religion. Lynn Margulis, mm. she's again an atheist evolutionary biologist. Her mm. end symbiotic theory is taught in every single did university. Did she get a in the prize world. of some sort? She did. She won the National Medal of Science, and right. Bill Clinton gave that to her. So again, she's an atheist. Yes. She called it an Anglo Saxon sect. Right. Um, Masatashi Nai, who is a don in population genetics, a subfield of evolutionary biology, again another Real atheist. Don. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, not, yeah. So uh, he's got these uh, formulas which yeah. are taught at an academic level in right. libraries across the world. He has said Darwin, and he doesn't believe in Darwin's um, mechanism, he believes in his own yeah. mutation-driven evolution. He says Darwin in our field is God, so you can't challenge him. Right. So these are atheist evolutionary academics saying mm. this is way more than science. Mm. Right? And one other thing which is very, very important, just a few months ago, there's a right. book published by Oxford University by an atheist evolutionary biologist right. called Darwinism as... Religion. religion. So mm. he wasn't a biologist, he was a philosopher of science, Michael Roos. Right. And what he argues in that book is that Darwin's theory is a valid scientific theory, yes. but it has morphed into a full-out religion. Not religion that believes in God, but right. a religion nonetheless. Okay, let's get straight into the question I uh, posed to you in the beginning of this session. We, we talked about certainty in terms of evolutionary theory. You're saying it's not as certain as evolutionists or let's say even popular atheists are making it out to be. So what is your evidence of that? Okay, all of the people I'm going to reference in this video yes. are people that you can go check up, learn, and you can actually find out that what I'm saying yeah. is based on what they're saying. Yeah. So first off, if we pick up any book on the philosophy of biology, right. philosophy of biology is a subfield in which if you imagine a biologist is studying organisms, right. And a philosopher of biology studying biologists. How do they come to conclusions? So yes. a basic book on this is Evidence and Evolution by Cambridge University okay. by the philosopher of biology, Elliot Sober, who's an atheist. Right. And what he says in this book is this. The, uh, Darwinian evolution is based on a probabilistic framework. Okay. And he talks about the multiple assumptions which are there. Okay. Likewise, we have Peter Godfrey Smith, Another philosopher of biology, he, yeah. printed, he published a book with Princeton University called Philosophy of Biology. Yeah. He's, does, he speaks about biologists are moving away from the tree of life, which right. we've been told is a fact, okay. to a web of life. Okay. So mainstream secular, and these two uh, individuals are atheists, mainstream secular universities and individuals and academics yeah. admit to three facts. Probabilistic framework, multiple assumptions which are being challenged, 
and its core concepts are disputable. disputable. Let's stick with two and three because one might be claimed to be not a problem. I mean, everything in, its, in a sense is probabilistic, right? Yeah, sure. But what we need to be careful about is this. Yeah. Remember the narrative they're telling us. They're okay. telling us it's as clear, it's a no-brainer, it's as clear as planetary motion. That's okay. not probabilistic. That's an observation. Right. So that's a very big claim. Okay. So probabilistic framework is something which automatically lowers that certainty that they're talking about. Okay. Um, some would say, though, I mean, we're talking about probabilistic framework. We don't have, we don't have a problem with that. Um, two and three, you mentioned some of the main major assumptions, like uh, you're going to probably go into homology or something like this. Well, right? before we move on to homology, what we need to realize is this. Yeah. Number one, Darwin and the way that he framed his theory yeah. and the way that he propagated it, yeah. he did it in, a, I believe, a very honest way. Yeah. And I believe he was a very hardworking scientist and many of his works have been misrepresented. Okay. For example, right. if you pick up a book on evolutionary biology today, a book about Darwinian evolution, like The Greatest Show on Earth, right. or uh, Jerry Coyne's Evolution is True, you're just going to get this theory is true, here's why it's true, here's why it's true, X, Y, Z. Okay. But if you pick up the origin of species, you find that Darwin, right in the beginning, he says something very, very important. Okay. He says, you can use the facts that I have in my book to come up with conclusions which are opposite to mine. Because he understands the philosophy of science. And the philosophy of science teaches us, one, you can have a conclusion, you can have observations in, in the future which can challenge your previous conclusion. Right. The black swan problem, problem induction. Two, you can always have the same data giving rise to multiple theories. Mm -hmm. Later on in chapter six of his book, he speaks about the problems with his own theory. Now look at the honesty of the man. Yeah. He puts together a theory and he puts together a chapter about the problems with his theory and he tries to iron them out and he admits some of these problems are insolvable. Some of these problems are more apparent than real, but I still think my theory is correct. But one thing that he says in his book, if this fails, his theory fails according to him, which is gradualism. That the variations that take place and evolution works at a gradualistic pace. He said, if this fails, then my theory will absolutely break down. Mm -hmm. And evolutionary biologists today understand that gradualism has largely failed. And is this uh, linked to things like punctuated equilibrium? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. But m moreover, I just want to kind of um, put a c case forward. Let's pretend I'm an evolutionary biologist. And I say, listen, we have, a diff we have a range of different data. We have, for example, the fossil record, archaeological data. We have RNA and DNA. We have the uh, baby uh, g genome development in, in animals and things like that. All of these things triangulate with each other to give you the same conclusion, which is that every living thing, in, in the biological words, is in congruence, but also goes back to one uh, life form. So in Absolutely. other words, we all go back to one, we're all descended from the same kind of singular life form. Sure. So this is the kind of primary theory, or kind of primary presupposition of evolution. How would you go around, you're saying it's not as, as, as clear as planetary motion. But the question is, isn't that enough evidence for you? Why is that not enough evidence for you? Okay, it's a very good question. Yeah. The only way I'm going to change your analogy is yeah. that if we were to have a conversation like this, yeah. it wouldn't be an evolutionary biologist sitting on the other side because an evolutionary biologist would know better than that. It's most likely to right. be a Darwinist. Because remember, an evolu not every single evolutionary biologist is in the a world Darwinist. is a Darwinist. Yeah. A but every Darwinist is an evolutionary biologist. Of course. Right. Okay. And Evolution is different to Darwinism. Okay. Evolution simply means biological change over time. Darwinian Darwinism. evolution yeah. is tree of life and the mechanism. Okay. Right. First thing which he said is very, very important. Let's flesh it out. Okay. So you're claiming as a Darwinist right. biochemistry, yeah. genetics, yes. anatomy, yeah. psychology, yeah. sociology, yeah. linguistics, yeah. biogeography, yeah. the fossil record, right. bioinformatics, yes. and every other sphere of by uh, um, the subfields of biology yeah, can be are, explained. are in congruence leading up to one conclusion. Yes. The very first thing I'll point out, right. without even knowing any science, is okay. that is impossible because science doesn't proceed like that. The same data can give rise to multiple conclusions. Okay. So that's the first point. Right. Secondly, if we delve into the data, we realize there's lots of black swans, lots of recalcitrant facts, facts uh, which resist the theory. Yeah, I was just going to ask you to uh, define that. So recalcitrant fact. Okay, recalcitrant fact is yeah. this, right? I've been accused yeah. of uh, murdering Ali Dawa, say, right? Okay. And I happen to be accused of murdering Ali Dawa Thursday at 6.30 um, on the 20th of September, whatever today's right, date okay. is, right? Now, the recalcitrant fact is you're an eyewitness 
and the person filming is an eye witness. Yeah, that you're here. That I'm here. That's right. a recalcitrant fact. Right. So recalcitrant fact is a fact which resists a theory. Right. Now, within evolutionary biology, we have recalcitrant facts in genetics, for example, orphan genes. We have recalcitrant facts when it comes to the fossil record in terms of punctuated equilibrium, uh, uh, saltational evolution. We have recalcitrant facts when it comes to random mutations in terms of natural genetic engineering. Now, these may sound like technical terms, but all I want you to understand is... It's basically, it's not incongruence. No. In, in, a, in a way which is 100%. It's not the only theory that's incongruence. You can come up with other theories besides that. Right. Because remember, I'm not saying those fields don't lead to Darwinism. They can. Right. But they can also lead to other theories. Right. So what you're saying, just to kind of simplify, is you're saying that the data that we have in front of us can be interpreted in a range of different of ways. And moreover, you're saying that if we want to stick to the fine um, kind of structure of Darwinian evolution, and we want to try and create what you would think is like a line of best fit, you'd see a lot of anomalous um, sort of dots on the scatter graph. Yeah. It, it wouldn't be just one line of best fit. Well, every this every is line, any theory. Every dot's going And the other thing line. is, look, I believe Darwin's theory to be a valid scientific model theory and yes. paradigm. But I, th but I think the reason why people get confused is because they conflate science with truth. Right. Science gives you workable models about reality which are falsified. Mm. It doesn't give you truth with a capital T. That's the beauty of science, that it keeps changing, keeps evolving, keeps changing as we get new data. I've got some questions for you. One of them is that you've mentioned um, in the things that you were mentioning as a subfield of biological change over time, um, you, you mentioned a few things like um, civilization or, or you, you called it um, basically how animals act together. Sociological behavior. Sociological behavior. behavior. Yeah. Uh, sociological behavior of animals. So is it the case that here, for example, chimps and human beings have the same sociological, um, are, they, are their behaviors more similar from a sociological perspective? According to, again, mainstream evolutionary biologists, this is where we have homoplasies. Homoplasies are similarities which are not due to common descent. So we have... Okay, hold on. Once again, to simplify. Sure. So you've got two key terms here. Yep. Right, one of them is homology, yep. and the opposite of that is homoplasy. So yep. can we quickly just sure. define? Right. Homology is an assumption yes. that similarities are due to common descent. Common descent. So common all descent. the similarities that we see in the animal yep. kingdom it is due to, is a result of, the fact that we are from the same, let's say... Uh, it's assumed that yeah, we're from a common ancestor. Common ancestor. And this is, the assumption of homology goes back to the Padma Purana 3,000 years ago, the ancient Indians. Now, Hindus, because they were philosophers, they were naturalists. Yeah, yeah. So... When it comes to homology, if someone uses it as an assumption, there's nothing wrong per se. Yeah. But if someone says this, and I want you to realize, and I'm just going to test you now, they use this argument all the time. Similarities are due to common descent. Right. Hey, look, similarities exist. Therefore, similarities are due to common descent. Right. What's wrong with that argument? It's a circular argument. It's a circular argument. Right. Sadly, we will find even documentaries using this sort of circular reasoning. Is this something which is fleshed out in the academic world? What you're saying Absolutely. Here, because what you're saying here is actually quite profound, let's be honest. Yeah? You're saying that the foundation of evolutionary, uh, Darwinian evolutionary models, or the, the one that we, we kind of acquainted with, uh, which is homology, one of the main assumptions, everything that it goes back to kind of common descent, all the, the differences or the, sorry, the similarities that we see, that is, that is due to common descent. You're saying that actually this itself, this foundational thing, cannot be proven in and of itself. Yep. Is, that your, is that your claim? I'm not claiming this. I'm going to give you an example of someone who points this out. Okay. Now, evolutionary... So this is not your claim? No, not my claim, and I'm going to give you an example. Right. Evolutionary biologists, they don't use this circular reasoning. This is used by people who are popularizers. Okay. All they say is, we assume it and they carry on. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with doing okay. that. Ronald Brady, he's a philosopher of biology, yeah. he's a mainstream secular academic. He published a paper in a journal called Cladistics, called on the, or um, on the Independence of Systematics. And what he goes on to say is this, this line of reasoning is circular. Right. If you wanna, if you wanna say that homology is true, you have to come up with an independent argument. You right. can't use this argument because it's circular. But it's, it's something which doesn't seem like you can put under a microscope. You can't, you can't. So it's how like can you this. prove it? You can't, you can't. It's an assumption. Right. Okay. And you move on. So if it's an assumption and it can't be proven, what you're effectively saying is that that which holds the house of, the foundations which hold the house of Darwinian evolution itself are unsound, or are not unsound, but unprovable. Of course. That's what you're saying. Of course. Well, that's not what I'm saying. This is what... That's what's being said in the academic world. That's what's being said in the academic world. Because no one tries to prove assumptions. But that's very profound. 
Well, it is, it is if we understand that the popular understanding is yeah. different to the academic understanding, but it's not profound for an academic. For if, see, if so they find, how do, how do basically uh, evolutionary biologists or Darwinists reconcile this? Because how can, they, how can they be so certain about something which hasn't got, which has, you could even say, axiomatic type presuppositions? Okay, now this is where it gets really, really interesting. Right. I find the language of people like Richard Dawkins very interesting because he is, after all, somebody who is seen as an authority in this field, although he is not, he's referred to as a science journalist. But what he does say in public is different to what he sometimes writes in uh, books. Right. Uh, lesser known works. So for example, when he met Hamza in uh, Ireland during the 2011 uh, World Atheist Convention, you know, he was talking about, you don't believe in evolution, it's just as clear as planetary motion, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Yet, in his book, A Devil's Chaplain, right. he goes on to say in this book that future facts, and I'm quoting him verbatim, mm. future facts may come to light which will force our uh, successors of the 21st century to abandon Darwinism or modify it beyond recognition. Wow, wow. Right? Now, what, what's yeah. basically going on here is this. Mm. He knows what he's talking about. He's an intelligent guy. Right. But there's two terms that need to be divorced. Evolution mm. and Darwinian evolution. Wow. This is what's causing the... Mm. So if I, if I say to you this thing, right? I say, is there a doctor in the house? We need a doctor. And there's a brother who has a PhD in philosophy. It's not the same thing. This is a medical doctor. That's the fallacy of equivocation. Yeah, fallacy of equivocation. Mm. This is what the Darwinists have been doing. They've been saying evolution is true. Look, the cells, they're dividing. They're doing this. Right, you know, right, you have bacteria, microbiology. Uh, microbiology, antibiotic medicine. And they use that to extrapolate to human chimp ancestry. Right. Not the same thing at all. It's a right. fallacy of equivocation. Let me ask you a question straight up. We've got some archaeological evidence of Lucy, of all of these um, uh, different... Homo erectus. Uh, Homo erectus, all these different things. Yep. Isn't this an evidence? Could this not be put into our database of evidences um, of the truthfulness of human chimp ancestry? Good question. All I would do, and I've said this previously, and there's no paleontologist in the world who would disagree. If somebody disagrees, please let us know. And you've, and you've debated Aaron Ra, and he's a paleontologist, isn't he? Well, he studied paleontology. Right. But... This is a mainstream thing which is understood in evolutionary right. biology. Okay. There are four assumptions when they look at Lucy or look at anything else. Okay. Number one is the assumption of naturalism. Yeah. Naturalism is everything has to be explained Naturally. naturalistically. Yeah. Hence why Darwin said if there was no fossils, it'd still be true. Right, because it, does, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. because The assumption is, so this is really axiomatic now. Yeah, of course it is. It's incredible. So it now it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, actually, the, the, the analogy that I think is good is, you know, have you ever been to a, a circus where they have a tightrope and they're no. playing, they're doing acrobatics? I've seen, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. Beneath it, they have a safety net. Right, okay. So above, if you like, that's the science. Okay. If they fall down, the naturalism is a safety net. Right, right, right. So right. Henry Gee, in his book, The Accidental Species, Misunderstanding the Human Evolution, he's an atheist evolutionary biologist. He's the senior editor of Nature, which is the most prestigious journal in the world. It's like the Premier League. Yeah. So way above people like Dawkins. He says in his book the same thing. He says if there's no fossils, human chip ancestry will still be true. And he says that because of homology. No, uh, naturalism. The assumption okay. of naturalism. And wouldn't that be coupled with, the, with homology? Okay. Assumption? No, but there's four assumptions which are separate. Right. Second assumption is homology. Right. Third assumption is there's only one origin. Right. Which is why humans, chimps have to be put together. You, me, a blade of grass, an elephant, an octopus. We're all family. Together. We're family because of the assumption of one origin. Yeah. That's an assumption. Fourthly, this is extremely important. Right. Even if these assumptions didn't exist, this is the most fundamental assumption. Okay, go ahead. And this is the one that's most challenged. Go on. From, to get from A to Z, we need a mechanism. Right. And that's natural selection. Right. If the mechanism fails, the history fails. Imagine there's a bridge. You've got two structures on either side, then you've got a beam. These structures are the mechanism of natural selection. The tree of life is the trajectory. Right. If these structures break, the tree breaks. So you're saying it's challenged. Why is it challenged? Well, anybody who knows the basics of evolutionary biology yeah. knows the mechanism is being challenged by mainstream academics, by an, a host of alternatives, evolution by self-organization, uh, uh, neo-mutationism, neo-Lamarckism, uh, neo that's becoming very popular. That's actually a dead theory which came back to life now. Right. Right. Uh, there's no also... No pun intended. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's a good point. And there's also evolution by natural genetic engineering. But are these fringe? Of course they are. They're very fringe, Absolutely. Aren't they? they are fringe. But what we have to understand is epistemically, mm. something may be fringe, but it's epistemically equal. Right, okay. 
So what you're saying here, uh, tell me what you're saying. So if someone comes, in a nutshell, let's try and say this. To summarize. The, to, sum, to kind of summarize, yeah. Assume I'm someone who's absolutely convinced as a matter of certainty that A, Darwinian evolution is true, and B, okay, that human chimp ancestry is certainly the case, okay? I'm going to come up to you and say, listen, I believe A and B. What would be, in a, in a kind of summarized nutshell, your response to show them that it's not certain? Okay, good question. Yeah. I would, firstly, if I literally had no time, I would ignore the science. Yeah. Simply go to the philosophy of science right, and say, on. philosophy of science is based upon limited set of data, generalizations, future data which can challenge the previous theory. The same data can give rise to multiple uh, theories. Yeah. Just based on those two things, you shouldn't be searching about anything in science because pick up any book on the philosophy of science, such as Philosophy of Science, a new introduction by Oxford University. Yeah. In it, it says, no it's scientific, no scientific mm. uh, theory, mm. no scientific conclusion can be concrete proof. Right. It can always change. Right, okay. And the second thing about human chimp ancestry. Well, what I would simply do, human chimp ancestry is based upon four assumptions. Uh, homology, naturalism, the mechanism, and a single origin. Yes. Secondly, all of Darwinian evolution is based on a probabilistic framework which has assumptions and which is disputable. And somebody may turn around and say to me, yeah, but Sabur, who cares? 99% of biologists believe in Darwinian evolution. I would say to them, well, guess what? So do I. But what does believe mean? They believe it to be a valid theory. Mm. It doesn't mean they believe it to be absolutely true. The same thing with me. As a Muslim, I believe it to be a valid theory, plausible theory. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not absolutely true. And obviously for Islamic reasons, you would opt out of believing that human beings have a common ancestor with a chimp. No, I would, but I wouldn't even have to be a Muslim to do that. Right. Because, for example, someone like David Stolf, he's a mainstream atheist Philosopher of Science. Darwinian Fairy Tales. Darwinian Fairy Tales, his yeah. popular book. Also, you have people like Jerry Fodor, mm. his book, What Darwin Got Wrong. And interestingly, and I think we didn't actually mention this point, they understand it's not absolute. But interestingly, this point we didn't actually mention, Darwin's theory is unique for five reasons. Go on. There's nothing, no other theory in the history of science which has these things. Number one, according to mainstream secular academics, it's turned into a secular religion. Mm. According to even Darwinists themselves. Yeah. Two, it influenced politics and it became into a sort of political system within itself. Mm -hmm. Stalin read The Origin of Species. That led him to atheism. When he killed people, he said that he thought he was doing natural selection. Third, an ethical system. People get a meaning out of it. You know, they, they drive morality from it. Fourthly, we have like mass... Like Herbert Spencer, social yeah, Darwinism. Of course, of course absolutely. Yeah. Four, we have mass propaganda. We have the popular perception and we have academia. Mm. And five, this is extremely important, is that apart from it being a religion, apart from it, the, the sociological aspect of it, sorry, the religion, the political aspect, the ethical aspect, the, uh, the propaganda, sociologically, if you go up to somebody and say, do you believe in this theory? Mm. They're like, yeah, yeah, I believe it to be true. Masses of people believe it to be true. But if you ask them for a whiff of evidence, it's just scratch the surface, they don't know. No. And I've experienced this myself. Mm. And I just want to end upon this. Yes. In Stanford, they did an experiment about social conformity and they put three lines on the board mm. and there was a group, group of people. One of them was a test subject. The rest of them were actors mm. and they had lines A, B, C. Mm. So they went up to everyone. Which line is the shortest? Mm. The shortest was C. Mm. This guy lied and said A, 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 A. It came to the test subject. All the rest of them were fake. He denied his own perception and he said A. <laughs> Even though he knew C was the smallest, mm. which goes mm. to show that human beings are social creatures. We go with the flow and we accept things because of authority without actually questioning them. And Darwin's theory is unique in the sense that you have millions of people who believe in it. It's a, it's a materialistic story for capitalism and it is something which is accepted without any evidence. Tell us, tell us, uh, yeah, sorry, you want to say the last thing? Yeah, that's it. That's There's it. five things about Darwin's theory which is unique. Okay, tell us about this. What's this? This is uh, a project called Darwinian Delusions, and the only purpose... What's the ship all about? The ship, well, the HMS Beagle, 1859, Darwin okay. went to the <laughs> island, right? All right? So what it basically is this. I want to make it clear what delusions is. I'm not saying somebody who believes it to be a valid scientific theory is deluded. Is I this a YouTube channel or something? It's a YouTube channel, okay. yeah. This is to show that if you believe it's certain, and if you want to bring your... If you don't bring meaning of life out of it, if you don't bring morality out of it, it, you know, from Darwin to Hitler, you should read this book, right? How it led 
the Nazis to do what they were actually doing in terms of their social Darwinism, then I would say you're pretty deluded because this is a valid scientific theory, but it's not the gospel truth. Interesting, interesting, interesting. People are going to be going on that, inshallah, and subscribing to it and listening to uh, more of Sabor and his research. Uh, is really truly eye-opening and I'm sure even if you're not a, a Muslim or let's say even if you are a Darwinian evolutionist you should be challenging challenging yourself and not really kind of relying on like the social narrative I mean at the end of the day social narratives uh, change and the way they do change uh, is by critical inquiry and I do invite everyone to critically examine uh, under the microscope of objectivity the uh, truthfulness of Darwinian evolution based on the information and obviously this is going to be a good uh, YouTube uh, channel for you to subscribe to anyways for uh, until next time Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh